Good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining us. I'm Kathy Willits, Director of Communications for University of Utah Health, and this is a partnership this morning with our colleagues at Intermountain. As many of you know, um, our University of Utah Health physicians work at Primary Children's Hospital, so this is a, a, a joint effort this morning. I want to be clear, this is not a press conference. We're not announcing anything, but uh, we're providing background on this new and emerging uh, condition that we're hearing about um, related to children and COVID-19. Many of you have had questions and we're receiving a lot of questions, both us and, and Primary Children's Hospital. So we wanted to provide an opportunity this morning to tell you everything we know so far about this condition. We're gonna kick it off uh, with some brief comments and then we're gonna open it up for questions. Be sure to use the chat feature of the Zoom call to submit your questions. Uh, we're going to start with Dr. Andrew Pavia, who's the chief, the Division of Infectious Disease at U of U Health and hospital epidemiologist at Primary Children's Hospital. We're also joined by Dr. Jill Sweeney with U of U Health and Primary Children's Hospital. She's a pe pediatric critical care physician. We have Dr. Dom Nam Trong, who, again, University of Utah Health and Primary Children's Hospital. She's a pediatric ca cardiologist. And finally, Dr. Erin Tremarki, U of U Health and Primary Children's Hospital. She's a rheumatologist. So we're gonna start with some comments from Dr. Pavia, then we're gonna open it up to questions and I'll direct the questions as you submit them through the chat function. Thank you. And I appreciate the chance to talk to you a little bit about this new syndrome that we're learning about very rapidly that we're calling right now multi-system inflammatory syndrome in uh, children. And it's a very new syndrome, so we're learning a lot as we go. And what I tell you will involve what we know, but there's a lot that we don't know, and keep that in mind as I talk about this. We began to hear reports coming out of the UK in April of uh, what appeared to be children who had Kawasaki's disease following uh, infection with COVID-19, with the coronavirus that causes that disease. It was pretty clear early on as the physicians in London and throughout the UK assembled their data that something very interesting was going on. Um, and they eventually put together uh, something under 40 cases. It was subsequently um, noticed in New York City that there were quite a few similar cases. And New York State began active surveillance, that is soliciting cases from pediatricians around the state and to date have found about 140 cases there are cases that have been reported from Italy and from uh, probably almost uh, three dozen states in the United States so far. The cases in the UK and in New York City, interestingly, appeared to peak about a month after the peak of infection with the coronavirus. <laughs> Excuse me. And in individual children, the disease seems to follow at a substantial time after the actual infection. So we are getting a pretty good understanding of what this syndrome looks like, but we don't yet know the entire spectrum of disease. Um, and one of the most important things we don't know is how common it is. At this point, it appears to be extremely rare. There are probably less than 200 cases reported worldwide. And as you know, we have three and a half million documented infections, but we are trying to learn the extent of the illness so far. This illness is characterized by children who come in with prolonged fever. They often have severe abdominal pain and rash, and they go on to develop inflammation of many organs, hence the name multi-system inflammatory syndrome. Uh, the most common symptoms are rash and fever, but many have redness of the eyes or conjunctivitis. Uh, some have swelling of the hands and feet, and these are the features that make it look like Kawasaki's disease. Other uh, symptoms that have been seen include swollen lymph nodes in the neck um, and sore throat, but these are less common. The laboratory findings are really distinctive. This illness is marked by lab tests that show a really high degree of inflammation and the immune system is clearly turned on in unusual ways. And that's one of the reasons that we have a multidisciplinary team here and throughout the country looking at this. Treatment so far has been quite successful. It's been initially targeted the kinds of treatments that we use for Kawasaki's disease. 
Um, and we, people have started using that type of treatment because one of the hallmarks of this disease is inflammation of the heart. It's often inflammation of the heart muscle and not of the coronary arteries as we often see in Kawasaki's disease. So overall, there are features that make it resemble Kawasaki's disease in many cases, but not all. But they're features that are telling us that it's actually a different illness. Now I want to uh, finish up by telling people that treatment seems to have been quite effective. Uh, there have been a few deaths around the world so far, but the majority of children have recovered well. We don't know what the long-term consequences, if any, are going to be. So what should parents know about this? It sounds very scary because anytime you associate the word new with a disease of children as parents, we become very uh, concerned. So the most important thing I think is that at this point it appears to be quite rare, but parents really should be um, attuned to sickness in their child. And if your child has prolonged fever, they have severe abdominal pain with or without a rash or red eyes, you need to contact your healthcare provider and they may uh, feel that you need to be seen in person. Many of the patients that have been described so far have developed severe disease and often ended up in the intensive care unit because of the involvement of the heart muscle and because of shock, that is low blood pressure. But we're beginning to learn that there's probably a broader range of manifestations and not all of the kids are severely ill. So as we learn more, we will try and update you on what we do know. We're gonna try and find out uh, if we can understand the way the immune system is doing this, how the virus seems to trigger this weeks after the illness, what the best treatments are, and if we can intervene early. And I think I'll stop there and let's um, move to questions. Yep, let's open it up to questions. Again, you can use the chat feature or the Q&A feature. And while we uh, start taking some questions, um, I'm, I'm gonna ask you, Dr. Sweeney, um, tell us what you're seeing um, when you've had children present in the intensive care unit of primary children's. What are the symptoms and, and, and how are you talking to parents about that? Sure. Um, most of what we know about this is what we've learned from our colleagues in Europe, Italy, and on the East Coast. Um, we have not seen a large number of these patients here in Utah, thankfully, um, but these patients um, at their sickest can present with shock um, and low blood pressure. Um, and they can sometimes present very similar to other um, overwhelming infections. And so it's really a matter of supporting them until we can do um, those lab tests and diagnostics that Dr. Pavia mentioned. Great, and we have a couple of questions about how many cases and how many confirmed cases. Dr. Pavia, I'm gonna direct that to you. Sure, at this point, we have uh, one patient that we think fits all of the criteria and has been reported as a case. There are uh, some other children who presented earlier who had Kawasaki's like disease in whom we will be doing some testing to see if this followed a coronavirus infection, in which case they would be cases. And we have a question about how severe the cases are um, that we're seeing in Utah. So either, either Dr. Sweeney or Dr. Pavia. Dr. Sweeney, do you wanna talk about that? Sure. Sure. Um, of the handful of patients that we've had, one of them have has required um, admission to the ICU, um, and that patient did need, need medications um, to help support their blood pressure. Um, these patients usually uh, turn around, you know, within three to five days. Um, but some of the reported cases um, that we've been hearing about have presented um, much sicker and have required um, mechanical ventilation as well as um, extracorporeal membrane support or ECMO. And uh, so that that brings up an, another question. What, what tests are needed to confirm whether or not a child has this condition? Dr. Sweeney? Sure. Um, it, 
it is somewhat a diagnosis of exclusion of common things that can make children very ill. Um, but as Dr. Pavia said, uh, there is a, a high amount of inflammation going on in the body. So we check a lot of inflammatory markers as well as um, checking whether they have a current or have serologic evidence of a previous COVID infection. Dr. Pavia, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was gonna say, um, you know, perhaps we should explain a little bit about the two tests we use. We use the PCR test to look for the virus that indicates a present or active infection. In these children, that's uh, present about a third of the time. And the other two thirds generally have antibody, but no virus, although some have both. And the presence of antibody indicates an infection any time in the past. Usually it takes about seven days to develop antibody. Dr. Pavia, what are the ages of the children who've been affected by this condition? So this is a striking feature. There have been um, cases ranging from under one year of age to up to 20, but the average is seven to eight years old. <clears throat> and that's quite different from Kawasaki's disease, which typically affects children uh, in the preschool years, two to three years of age. What about the ages of children here in Utah? I know you mentioned one confirmed case and I'm sure you're looking to confirm others. What are the ages of those children or the one confirmed case? Um, yeah, I, I think it's probably best not to talk about individual patient data. Okay. And uh, I, I want to direct a question to uh, Dr. Trong. Dr. Trong, can you talk to us a little bit about the, the cardiovascular element to this condition? Yes, that seems to be one of the most striking features of uh, MISC. And as Dr. Pavia had noted, one of the most common heart findings that we're seeing is that the muscle of the heart is being in, uh, affected so that the squeeze of the heart is affected and often decreased in these kids. Um, in some of the reports uh, out of Europe and the UK, somewhere up to 50% of patients have decreased um, squeeze of the heart or decreased function of the heart. Um, also, Dr. Pivi mentioned the coronary artery abnormalities. Um, and again, it varies by uh, what country and what they've been reporting. But again, it's been up to 20 to 25% uh, in some uh, reports. And so by the coronary artery abnormalities, what we're seeing is uh, dilation or mild enlargement of the coronary arteries um, to what we call aneurysms, which are outpouchings of the coronary arteries uh, themselves. Um, other things that people have seen are uh, small fluid collections around the heart um, and also uh, some leakiness of the valves as well. And a question for you, Dr. Tremarki, uh, as a rheumatologist, tell us, tell us what you're seeing from your perspective, what are what are the what are the conditions that relate to rheumatology? So, in pediatric rheumatology, we do take care of children with high levels of inflammation. Um, specifically, we see something called macrophage activation syndrome, and that tends to happen in a group of children who have a certain type of childhood arthritis. So, we do see it in other conditions as well. And what happens is the immune system reacts to a trigger and either overreacts, becoming very active, or is unable to turn itself off and keeps producing levels of inflammation, or in some degrees, both. So what we've seen with MISC is some of these features are similar to what we see in macrophage activation syndrome and other types of significant inflammation, um, which is why we are partnering with our colleagues at Primary Children's to help with these patients. Why does this condition affect children and not adults, Dr. Pavia? Um, whoever you ask that to is going to give you the same answer. We don't know yet. And that's one of the questions we really need to answer. There are a lot of things about the immune system in children uh, that are quite different, and their response to this coronavirus is quite different. What we didn't talk about earlier is that the, the initial infection in children tends to be much milder. 
uh, only one to two percent of all cases in the U.S. and around the world have been in children, and a very uh, small percentage of children with the infection get sick enough to be hospitalized or require intensive care. And that's quite different even than young adults. There's probably some relationship between the way they handle the initial infection and the fact that in a few children, it triggers this dramatic over response. But we will be working hard around the world to try and tease that apart and figure it out. And Dr. Pavia, I know this is still very new, but do we have a sense yet of what the fatality rate is? There are just a handful of deaths that have been reported uh, from New York City, um, Italy, and the UK have seen fatalities. I'm not aware of others in other parts of the United States, but we can't really give you an accurate uh, message on that because we don't know the true number of cases overall. We know the deaths at this point. It appears to be a pretty low percentage of children who do die, even though many are quite sick, in the range of something that will probably end up being under 1%, but we're just guessing at this point. And given our large uh, number of children in Utah, what, what is the threat level to Utah? Uh, people might be concerned because we have so many kids here. How concerned should they be, Dr. Pavia? Well, the threat is going to depend on how many children get infected with the coronavirus. So there's a lot that we can do about that. And there's a lot that, you know, you and I can do to protect children. Um, and all of us can. So um, these are the social distancing measures, the use of masks, the hand hygiene. And if children don't get infected with this coronavirus, then there's no chance that they're going to develop MISC. <clears throat> if we don't control the spread of infection or if we accept a high rate of infection throughout the community, uh, then eventually we will see more cases. Dr. Tremarki, I'm going to direct this question to you and, and please feel free free to direct it to someone else if you're not the correct person, but what would a standard course of treatment be once a diagnosis is made? Uh, so I would say right now, I think we don't necessarily know that it's going to be variable. Um, as Dr. Pavia mentioned earlier, as many of these children are presenting similar to Kawasaki disease, we are starting with treatments that we know work well in children who have Kawasaki disease. Um, and I think a lot of that will be based on how their levels of inflammation respond. And knowing that we have other medications available if they don't respond to our first line treatment. Okay. And, and perhaps Dr. Tuang wants to add something to that. She's mm -hmm. an expert in the treatment of Kawasaki's and has participated in many uh, studies Yes, uh, thanks, uh, Andy. So, yes, as Dr. Tremarki mentioned, uh, since a lot of these patients meet either the what we consider to be the complete criteria for Kawasaki disease or the incomplete criteria for Kawasaki disease, um, we've been going along those treatment algorithms, uh, which typically uh, first line is pooled immunoglobulins, uh, which is pooled antibodies from the community. Um, as well as aspirin uh, therapy uh, for its anti-inflammatory effects. Um, also, some centers have used things like steroids, which again, in kids with Kawasaki disease, um, uh, often in patients that are potentially considered high risk, uh, such as if they already have coronary artery involvement, which we see in Kawasaki disease, we would typically treat with steroids as well. Um, and then for kids who continue to fever, as Dr. Tremarki said, uh, continue to show significant uh, signs of inflammation. Um, treatments for Kawasaki disease have included uh, specific uh, blockade of certain points within the inflammatory cascade. So there are several things that other centers have tried, um, again, along this Kawasaki disease treatment spectrum. Um, in terms of trials at this point, specifically for MISC, and we're still in the infancy of what we know, and we don't know what works best at this point, but so far there has been promising evidence that uh, IVIG does, has helped so far anecdotally in, in what people have been seeing to help these kids turn around 
um, and uh, help with the fever and the inflammation. But again, I think there's a lot that we don't know yet, specifically about MISC. Dr. Pavia, a question for you. When we find a case, do we know if other members of the family have have tested positive for either COVID-19 or the antibody or what, what kind of contact tracing or, you know, epidemiology studies are we doing in these families? Sure. That's a very good question. So one of the criteria for suspecting MISC could be a documented infection in a family member, even if the child has not tested positive at this point. Every patient who is diagnosed with its child or adult with evidence of coronavirus is contacted by the health department and they will do contact tracing. And that would involve reaching out to all the close contacts. So when a child has MISC, of course the family represents the first layer of contacts and they would be investigated by the health department. And then uh, they would expand the circle outwards depending on their other contacts. But I, one thing that you know might've been part of that question is has there ever been a uh, family in which there have been two children with MISC, and to our knowledge, no, uh, which is really interesting because that also suggests that there may be some factors we don't yet understand that we could uh, at some point understand that would help us understand why one child gets MISC and another recovers quickly with a mild illness. Can a child test positive for MISC and not have any symptoms? Dr. Pavia? Well, MISC by definition is a syndrome, a collection of symptoms uh, at this point that includes fairly severe symptoms. So um, coronavirus infection, COVID-19, can occur in children with no symptoms at all. It can occur with significant pneumonia early on, although that's quite rare. And then MISC is this illness that appears to occur in the recovery phase uh, for this very small minority of children. So no, um, by definition, if you're well, you don't have MISC. Do we have any other questions from media this morning? If so, type that in quickly. Um, otherwise, I'm gonna, uh, in, any other final comments from, from Dr. Pavia and anyone else on our panel? Dr. Pavia. Well, one thing we didn't talk about is the ongoing research and groups um, have banded together from Europe and the United States to try and collect information because with a rare disease, the only way we can make progress is by collaboration. And there's been an incredible degree of national and international collaboration and uh, people at Primary are participating in several of those uh, large multi-group studies to try and get answers. Okay, I'm not seeing any other questions, so I think we're going to wrap it up. And uh, if any of you have any follow-up questions for us, just uh, send either myself or Jen Tumor-Cook from Primary Children's uh, Hospital an email, and we'll be sure to follow up with you. Thank you, everyone, for joining us this morning.